David Walden, welcome to Nepali Dance Studio. Thank you and welcome to ISIMOD. Thank you. The International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, the organization you head, has this week released an assessment of the Himalayan region. It is an exhaustive report, nearly 700 pages yes. long. Why was this assessment needed at this time? Well, what we see this assessment, by the way, is about the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. And what we sensed was we just don't know, especially with climate change, migration, a range of issues. We just want to get a good picture of what's happening in the mountains. Uh, but more importantly, uh, what we wanted to do is see if we could put our minds together to come up with some policy, import, some policy recommendations in this uh, juncture in time, where we are really facing uh, some issues around sustainable development. We have the SDGs coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the uh, UNFCCC uh, uh, discussions going on. Uh, the IPCC report, mm -hmm. but we really don't know what's happening so much in our mountainous areas. So we wanted to bring minds together, both to say what's happening and then to come up with some very strong policy uh, recommendations. What are some of the key findings? Well, the, the first uh, big uh, finding is around climate change, that what happens um, that mountains actually warm faster than the global average. So we get what we call elevation dependent warming uh, in the mountains. So even if we could hit uh, a 1.5 degree world, right, we'd still see that warming in the mountains would be on the order of 1.8 degrees. But uh, in fact, what happens if we follow the same trajectory in the world, we could see warming up to uh, four, five, six, or seven degrees in mountain areas. So we find that uh, mountains are highly vulnerable to climate change. But secondly, what we see is, is not just climate change, is that mountains are facing tremendous changes as we're speaking today. So for example, out migration is a big change. Uh, we see changes in ecosystem. So all of these changes are working together and really presenting a challenge to, as to how people manage this important resource. And third, just thinking about mountains themselves. Uh, the, the idea is uh, of the report also is to establish the value of mountain resources to the world, right? Certainly to Asia. So for example, uh, from the mountains, we have uh, 10 major river basins. And uh, it, uh, yes, a mountain population of 240 million people, but uh, over 1.6 billion people living downstream dependent on those water resources that comes from mountains. So we had all, all the people getting together and, and putting their best knowledge, collating knowledge. We had 350 people working on it, quite an elaborate process, right? So one is you have to frame it, what are we gonna cover? That was a discussion with policymakers. Then you, what do we cover in each of these chapters? And there's debate and discussion, and then very critical review. Uh, so the, the, this process took uh, probably about four, four or five years until we got to this point. But the process itself was uh, Im important to exercise in, in building a community across countries, across the world to deal with climate change and other issues. So one particular prediction is quite shocking that our mountains are um, going to lose 64% of the glacier by the end of the century. What impact will this have on Nepal and downstream countries? Yeah. So the, just uh, what happens it, again if we were to reach that 1.5 degree world, that would be very difficult, but let's say we can do it. We'll still lose about one third of our glaciers, right? If present uh, trends continue, then we'd lose 64% or let's say two thirds of our glaciers into the future, right? Which is quite frightening. In a way, it's, uh, it's just the, uh, it's like a thermometer gauge. It's a pure signal of climate change, but, it, but also what it's telling us is that the climate impacts in the mountains can be quite severe. 
And it looks like the impacts on snow lines, um, glaciers, permafrost and rivers um, are much worse than the worst case scenario predicted in Paris two years ago. I also, my sense uh, in Paris too, th uh, by the way, that's true for the world. Probably, the, probably the, it looks worse for the glo world now than it did in 2017. But also my sense in Paris was we're basing things off that 2014 IPCC report. And like I say, it had little on the mountains. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I can't say that, that it looks worse for mountains than it did in Paris. Mm -hmm. I think only now we're coming out with some really good pictures. And, and in the next cycle of IPCC reports, we will have good information. And this assessment report contributes, and I think IPC is very happy to get this, so it can have a good picture of mountains. And in fact, for example, uh, uh, ISIMOD itself has about 10 authors mm -hmm. in, in the next IPCC report. There'll be a special chapter, uh, a cross-cutting chapter on mountains. Uh, there, there, in addition, there's a report on 1.5 degree world that just got released and one coming out on uh, cryosphere and oceans where ISIMOD and also authors in this assessment have contributed. So what we really see for the first time is that we'll get these issues of HKH Hindu Kush Himalayas highlighted uh, in IPCC. But um, don't you feel like we already have enough evidence of, of the global warming impact on the Himalaya region, of the, on the Himalaya? Do we still need more research? Uh, isn't it time we start taking some action? Well, well I think I, it's always time. Uh, basically, there's, we know enough to take action. That's very true. But I do think in this situation with, with a lot of interrelated changes, all that evidence will only help policymakers to take much better action. Right, so that's certainly there are things we can do, right? We can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we can prepare better for floods and droughts. But it, it's really an uncertain world when we're looking to the future. So I, I, I do believe uh, that more information, more research will help us take much more refined uh, decisions uh, in the future. We feel that there's an opportunity uh, that if that a mountain focus, an environment focus, a science focus can actually bring countries to work together. And in fact, we've seen that just in the production of the assessment report itself. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's a great opportunity uh, for moving into the future. So um, two ECMOD member countries are major fossil fuel users. Um, isn't it time we start looking beyond adaptation to mitigation measures? Yeah. Well, I think I de definitely. I think when I mean, the, I was just at a regional meeting of uh, for Asia Pacific uh, ministers on environment, and and that came out strongly that the I mean the best help for adaptation is really through mitigation. Uh, so we look at uh, our member countries, India and China, and I, China is taking significant steps uh, in their mitigation, as is India. And I believe the report findings, that when they come out like this, I hope we can use that to continue our discussion with all the countries who, who are greenhouse gas emitters and uh, to try and really take urgent, urgent action. That's what this report as well as many others are taking. We have to keep the world to 1.5 degrees. Otherwise, these mountains are going to, be in, going to be in deep problems. What specifically can we do in Nepal to ensure food security? For instance, um, as the dry season flow on our rivers go down because the ice has melted away. Yeah. Yeah, so, the, that's, uh, so what came out striking in the report is the degree of malnourishment and food insecurity in all of the mountains, right? It's pretty, it's pretty uh, alarming in the report. Um, so it's, uh, and then on top of that with the climate change impacts, uh, yeah, we see dry season. The hit is most likely on the dry season flows, which are also important uh, uh, for food security as well. But food security goes beyond that big production of rice in the Terai. 
and part of it, I think we're, we have to pay attention to agriculture again in the mountain areas. Now that probably will look different uh, in mountains than it say was 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, uh, where people were a lot of times subsisting on, on uh, rice, wheat, traditional crops. The potential in mountain areas is really these high-valued mountain niche products, right? The, the fruits, the, the uh, millet, the sorghum, uh, the coffee. But what it means is the agriculture will look something like uh, growing mountain products, getting them to the market, getting the money back to mountain communities, and then, uh, and then using that funds to buy enough food and more nutritious food in the future. Um, your report also deals with air pollution and natural uh, disasters. Yes, right. Um, what are some key recommendations to reduce risk from these? The, the, well, uh, the uh, air pollution one, in a sense, is this slow-moving natural disaster, right? Not like a flood that hits all of a sudden. And it's just, uh, in, in, the, in the future, it's just uh, making sure we have very clean energy as well, right? And, and reducing uh, emissions from, uh, from, for example, automobiles, uh, brick kilns, reducing open fires. Even the open fires that we all make at our houses, we all have to be conscious about that. So it, it, is, uh, it is an area that also we have to take action, uh, but it will require some education too of, of all of us. By the way, the, the air pollution hits is also on glaciers. So we find that the air moves up, the black settles on the glaciers and, and increases this uh, glacier melt in the future and contributes to the climate change impacts. And then it also plays around with the heating and cooling effects of the atmosphere as well. So that's something that's very much regional, right? That air moves in the region and something we have to deal with urgently as well. Now you said natural disasters because I think the other part is the uh, floods and droughts as well as landslides uh, and, uh, and earthquakes as, as well. But uh, the key message there is, uh, we just have to be uh, much better prepared. And that does require investments in uh, better information about what's happening with the uh, weather. It requires what we call climate services, of getting that information out to people, uh, putting up uh, flood early warning systems, uh, but also um, just uh, thinking about where people live, right? Not necessarily in the floodplains as well. A lot of uh, times, you know, the report is giving uh, kind of, kind of a little bit gloomy scenarios about climate change, about uh, migration, for example, about food security. But on the other hand, uh, it also presents some, some optimism uh, that there are solutions, say, with renewable or sustainable energies. There's a lot of opportunities with uh, business getting involved in being part of the solutions. There's opportunities, say, with high-valued, uh, high-valued uh, mountain products and getting them to the market, getting more income into the country. So we, we did spend a lot of time, and that's perhaps uh, where we need to focus a, a lot of our effort. There's a lot of uh, opportunities in science, too. So I think uh, getting our minds really focused on these problems, bringing bringing that knowledge, bringing local people who have that knowledge together, kind of interacting with communities who have a lot of indigenous knowledge, uh, kind of upping that is a big opportunity when we're moving forward. Mr. Molden, on the behalf of Nepali Times, thank you so much thank for your you. time. Sir.